So a few days ago I did a video about my successful and failed experiments this year. So today I thought I would do a similar video but I'll be looking at what experiments I'm planning to do next year. And it would be really great to have some feedback on some of these because obviously they're experiments so I don't know whether they're going to work or they're not going to work. So these experiments they tend to reflect significant challenges really that we've got um, in terms of trying to be self-sufficient through the whole year and not compromising at all in terms of the diet that we eat. And so the first one of these is baking potatoes and you've heard me talk quite a bit about this because you know I think baking potatoes are one of the biggest challenges that you face as a self-sufficient gardener. You tend to finish your baking potatoes that are in store in about May time and then traditionally you're not going to get any more until sort of August, September time and that's a long time to be without bakers. So let's talk about the first experiment. So the first experiment is going to be with Aaron Pilot. We already know from past experience this year that we can grow Aaron Pilot to baking potato size nice and early in the year. So I think the key to that is making sure, as I said, that they get enough light and they get enough heat. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start them fairly early, so maybe even in February. Uh, we'll start them indoors so they're getting plenty of heat and we'll start them in pots. So we want them in probably, you know, six inch pots or something like that. Um, and single tuber in, in each pot and obviously they don't need any light so they could just be tucked anywhere under a desk in a, in a corner of a bedroom or somewhere uh, just so that they germinate in the warmth so you're going to get a nice well germinated potato that thinks it's May time uh, when it breaks surface obviously it needs light now we're going to keep it inside so we're going to put it on a windowsill uh, sunny windowsill or we're going to put it on the kind of edge of my grow lights or something like that. I'm not going to give it loads of light, I'm going to give it just enough again so it thinks it's May. Let it grow until it's sort of this sort of size, um, maybe a foot tall, something like that. And then I'm going to plant it in its container. Now I'll bury it with soil and I'll leave it again indoors. And so again it'll still think it's outside in May, uh, growing away in the warmth until again it breaks surface again and gets about six inches of growth. Now I think by then it's going to be uh, well on into March, you know, so we're coming towards the end of March probably. Now at that time light levels here are really high. Um, it's still cold, we're getting plenty of frost and things like that, but given the light levels are good we're going to bring it into the polytunnel where I'm sitting now and we're going to protect it with fleece over overnight and so all the way through April and May it's going to grow with good light levels plenty of sunshine here in April and May good heat levels cold at night but a nice fleece blanket at night to keep it warm so I think doing those things we're going to get baking potatoes hopefully in in the, uh, the beginning of June so basically then I'm going to do almost exactly the same thing with charlottes. The only difference is the charlottes I'm going to leave more than 90 days. I'm going to leave those 100, 120 days, something like that, again to give them good size. But basically they're just going to be in the polytunnel for a little bit longer, but they're going to grow in exactly the same way. So those are going to get harvested at the beginning of July. I'm also going to do some of those in my coal frames as well as in the polytunnel just because I don't have as much space in the polytunnel in, um, in June uh, as I do outside. I've got plenty of space outside at that time of year. So that's what I'm going to do. And I, you know, I think that that will give me their bakers all... The Aaron Pilot don't keep very well, so they're perfect for the sort of June, um, for the May period. And then the... Um, so for the June period, and then the uh, Charlottes are perfect for the July period through to August, and then we'll uh, obviously be you know harvesting early main crop uh, potatoes, which again might be Charlotte just planted and, and grown in a more traditional way. So that's the first experiment: early baking potatoes. I'm really excited about it. I'd love your feedback. Any other ideas that you've got as to how I can do so it? So the next experiment is with my peppers, and what I'm planning to do is grow all of them outside under low tunnels, planted a little bit later than I've traditionally planted them. Normally plant them early May, but it just seems to be, you know, if we get good weather in May, then we also get frost in May, 
and I lose a few of the peppers and it's just very stressful worrying that I'm going to lose all my pepper crop so I'm not going to do that I'm going to not plant them say until late May and um, probably you know third week in May something like that when we're guaranteed not to get a frost we've never had a frost that late and um, yeah and that means I get free up the polytunnel for things that grow higher up into the canopy um, and really making use of the height that I've got here so I mentioned that yeah, I want to use things that grow high in the polytunnel and so the bed that I used to put the peppers on which is the one down here um, I'm planning to put beans, tomatoes, cucumbers and melons so all things that take advantage of the height the beans probably won't last very long but when I take the beans out I'll put later cucumbers in so a second succession of cucumbers so I think that that should work really nicely uh, I'm quite excited about it um, more tomatoes which is never a bad thing uh, but also I've never grown melons before and you know I'm hopeful I'll get a nice crop off those and yeah more cucumbers in the ground I've tried cucumbers in containers I just don't like doing it it's just too much hard work to keep them uh, well hydrated um, and not too wet and not too dry and I think in the ground everything just self moderates it's much easier to so do. One of the big successes from last year and actually the previous year was growing um, strawberries up in the canopy here in the polytunnel in hanging baskets um, but there's only so many strawberries you can do that way you know just to have enough space and just you know hanging baskets are not perfect for strawberries and it does mean that every year you're disposing of those strawberries so the ones that you've forced in the polytunnel uh, you just don't you know you don't want to use them for a second year and so it's a bit of a faff but this uh, but it's great yeah I get them really early about May time um, we're eating them and it's El Santa is the variety that we grow which isn't you know really known as an early strawberry and it does perfectly well for us um, just as early as anything else that we've tried uh, but the taste is just you know it's just fantastic it's just so reliable as well. Year we want a follow-on crop of strawberries so something in June uh, and so what we're going to do or I've already done is plant strawberries in one of the coal frames and uh, although you might seem well that's a quite a waste of the strawberries in some ways it is and in some ways it isn't strawberries for us are just one of the absolute best crops we have eaten them all the way through uh, winter and early spring and so when we get them you know there's just a fantastic um, addition to the diet and obviously the ones in the polytunnel are nice but that's really we're only getting a handful a day for that from those so it's really just a snack was you know by having a bigger bed um, in the coal frame then hopefully that's a meal a day of those plants so I'm really excited for that but what I'm also doing is I'm growing garlic into planted into those beds and so hopefully that just increases the productivity of the bed a little bit I'm going to leave that bed over winter um, uh, you know it's a perennial bed for the next two or three years um, yeah it's just a little bit of a sacrifice in terms of productivity but just it's worth it for the richness of the diet so one of our other favorite things to grow in summer is golden purslane it's just such a fantastic salad ingredient and i've raved about it in previous videos but it is hard to get going early in the year uh, and it's hard to keep going late in the year and so again what i'm going to try there is a similar trick to what i'm doing with the strawberries I'm going to grow it up here in the canopy in the polytunnel in um, hanging baskets and we tried that this year just with one hanging basket and the yield we got off it was fantastic so hopefully I'm, I'm really hoping that I get a month earlier and a month later in the season by doing that uh, probably from different plants because they do tend to get a little bit exhausted after you've been picking them and picking them and picking them week after week after week um, so yeah I'll start my early plants off in the polytunnel in hanging baskets and then I'll move to the, the bed uh, or the beds that we've got outside for the middle of summer and then end of summer and or, uh, autumn uh, we'll move back to another crop in the polytunnel so yeah I'm really really excited about that we just absolutely love, love golden purslane and if you've not tried it and you like salads then it's definitely one to grow. So we're still in the polytunnel and one of the things that we've done in the polytunnel every year is we've grown a lot of spinach and salad crops but what we find is that come sort of the middle of February moving into March 
we've just got so much spinach and salad outside in the coal frames and the low tunnels that we re really don't need it in the polytunnel and so we end up with just a lot of wastage really. Uh, we've also tried growing brassicas in here again it doesn't really make that much sense because I'm planting the brassicas in October but I've got so many brassicas outside all the way through October, November, December, January, February and I'm only starting to really use the ones in the polytunnel in March and April and early May. And then, so I'm, I'm basically these beds are really underutilized in March, April and early May. But that isn't quite enough time to bring other crops to maturity. So what I'm doing is I'm just delaying this main bed of tomatoes and cucumbers and I'm, I'm gonna delay it by two weeks. And I think if I do that, then I can start getting carrots, turnips, beetroot, cauliflowers and calabrese, five of our favourite crops, off these beds where previously they were quite underutilised. But that is just a fantastic set of crops to bring to maturity in the hungry gap. And all it means is that I'm delaying putting the tomatoes in by a couple of weeks and doing a little bit of clever interplanting just to get things going a little bit earlier on in the season. So I'll start planting them in February in between, yeah, by taking some of the lettuces and spinach out, but still leaving some of them in. So there's just enough to keep us going through that, hung, that early, that mid February to early March period. And then by the time we get to you know, the middle of March, there'll be none of those, no, no lettuce, no spinach in here because it will all be outside. And you know, then everything's got loads of space. So the beetroot, the turnips and the carrots uh, and the brassicas have got loads of space. So that's what I'm planning to do in here. And I think it's, you know, it'll be a whole extra crop that I'll get out of the polysol. Um, and you know, it's just, it's just fantastic. I love getting so many different crops uh, out of the same space. So let's talk about something I'm going to do outside, just an ordinary thing that anybody can do without a polytunnel. So one of the things we have pretty much, well we definitely have it every week if not every day, is spinach of some description. So if I'll start off in midwinter then we're eating field beans normally as our spinach substitute because they grow really well over winter. Even in the depths of winter you can still harvest those and they still keep on growing. So they're a fantastic winter spinach. And then in spring, we'll switch to true spinach. Well, actually, um, late winter, we'll switch, switch to true spinach with a bit of field beans as well, because you know they're just as good as spinach and some people like them even more. But then by about April time, we've finished with the field beans, so we're not harvesting those anymore. We're full on true spinach. And then normally what we do is we switch to New Zealand spinach in midsummer and then we'll harvest all that through midsummer and then we're back to true spinach in about September time. And that's kind of when the New Zealand spinach is starting to finish. But this year we tried Mikado spinach and we did that in, we were eating that in August. But Mikado spinach is an Asian spinach and our experience was that it really bolted quite slowly and that's the trouble with growing true spinach in summer, it just bolts so fast. So what we're thinking of doing is going all in on Mikado as well as New Zealand spinach. So we'll grow about a th perhaps a third of the New Zealand spinach that we did this year, but quite a lot of Mikado uh, in June and July and August, and actually even into September probably. So yeah, I mean, again, it's just really exciting for us this because it's just really nice to have a true spinach. New Zealand spinach is fantastic. One of the great things about it is it freezes really well um, uh, it's nice in salads um, in moderation provided you pick the right leaves. Some of the leaves can be a little bit tough in a salad but you pick the suc succulent ones and they're really lovely. Um, so yeah I mean it's another exciting experiment. So we really like leeks and we're using leeks all the time um, over winter and that's fine um, and they're a great winter crop but we would like some leeks into spring and summer and so what we're thinking of doing there is growing garlic and elephant garlic for that purpose. So elephant garlic um, is in the leek family and you can use the stem as if it were a leek, but elephant garlic is kind of coming into its peak just at the time when the leeks are finishing. So it's just perfectly timed for that. 
and then late planted garlic, so garlic that's planted in February, March and April and early May, then kind of takes over from the elephant garlic and uh, just gives you a nice kind of continuity of harvest. And then by the time the elephant garlic is, sorry, the true garlic that was planted late, so the stuff that's planted in May, by the time that is finishing, again, the early leeks are just coming on stream. So we're hoping again to get this nice rich diet with leeks all the way through the year. I should point out that when I'm talking about garlic, I'm not talking about using the garlic cloves as a leek alternative. I'm mean, talking about using the garlic stem. So that's harvesting the garlic when it's a little bit immature, when the stem is really still nice and green and succulent. So that's what we call green garlic. And then back to the hungry gap theme. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try growing perennial kale as an annual. So one of the best things about perennial kale is it really puts on a nice flush of growth in April and May and June, which is just the time when all your other kale is going to seed. And so it's, um, it's a fantastic crop to sort of see you through the hungry gap. Um, what we're going to try this year, and I've already done it, is I've taken loads of cuttings off my perennial kale plants. I've got nine cuttings growing along nicely. I'm going to plant those out in February time, uh, just in a bed close together, because I want relatively small leaves, like a lot of small leaves, which are really tender. Uh, if you just leave a perennial kale to grow to its own devices, you get these massive great big leaves, you know, this sort of size. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think, and this is the experiment, that if I plant it really densely, so nine plants to a square metre or something like that, that I'll get a profusion of small leaves. And that's the same trick that we do. And we've proven works fantastically well with Brussels sprouts where you know we plant something like 27 plants to a square meter and we get this you know mass huge mass of relatively small really tender sprout leaves at about the same time so about the sort of may time um may through to june and i could say that's the time when it's so difficult to get other types of kale because the new season kale isn't big enough and the old season kale has all gone to seed so yeah that's the way we're going to try doing our perennial kale and because it's an experiment we're still going to do leave our big perennial kale plants in the ground um, but if this works then we might sort of migrate a little bit more to this idea of just you know having one or two perennial kale plants use those as stock to take cuttings from and then plant out the perennial kale for this hungry gap harvest. Now, I always multi-sow my beetroot, but what I've found over time is that although it's fantastic for the summer harvest, it's because uh, over the summer harvest, you want to be picking beets for a long period of time. So you want to pick the biggest and then leave the smallest three, for example. And then a few weeks later, you come along and pick the second biggest and then the third biggest and then the smallest. Um, and it just gives you a really nice long harvest period and so that's fantastic but very early in the season and late in the season I don't want to do that early in the season in the ones I'm growing in the polyton I just want to pick them all at the same time clear the bed and replant with tomatoes and it's a similar story in the autumn I want to clear the whole bed put all those beetroot into storage and replant the bed with field beans or something so I don't want this continuity of harvest, I want consistently sized beetroot. And so what I'm planning to do is just grow single beetroot rather than multi-sow them. I think that's going to be a lot better. But one of the things that enables that really is by growing under grow lights, because what I've found is that it takes forever to get your beetroot to get really good root development. Um, so that they'll come out of the modules nice and clean and plant and transplant successfully in the in the heart heart of summer so you're normally doing this in july which is the worst possible time to be transplanting something and so it needs a really good root system uh, and i've just found that you know if you're multi-sow you get more roots in the module because you've got say three plants three plants worth of roots in the module so it comes out really well there's very little root disturbance but if you just put one in then you know it's much harder to get that module full of roots and then get a successful transplant but under grow lights i found that that isn't a, as much of a problem i get really good root development uh, and so that's what's enabled this change in strategy so yeah i'm hoping 
that this works really well. Um, what we did get this year, although we got a fantastic beetroot crop, we did get a lot of small beetroot. Um, and we've got less ground dedicated for beetroot to next year than we had this year, so I really need to make sure that I get less small ones and more big ones which are suitable for storage. So we're nearly there. So the next one that I'm going to do is I've been doing a lot of pre-watering my holes with fish emulsion and seaweed emulsion to give the plants an early start, a really good start. Well, I'm actually going to do a proper experiment there where I'm going to do half the bed one way and half the bed the other way and we'll see if there's any actual difference. I mean, I think intuitively that there is a difference, but uh, it's, you can't really beat doing a proper experiment. And then finally, I'm gonna do a lot of interplanting, loads more interplanting, because we've got quite a lot less ground than we had last year. And so, and I, interplanting just appeals to me if I can get it right. I've had some bad experiences with it, but this year, I'm gradually building up a sort of repertoire of successful interplants uh, and knowing exactly how to do them. So all of these things will be the subject of dedicated videos when I actually do the experiments uh, and follow up videos. But I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of all the things I'm planning to do. And yeah, as I said, I'd love a bit of feedback. If you think of anything on this list that isn't going to work or you think it is going to work or you think there's a better way of doing it or whatever it is, then let me know in the comments. My name's Steve, this is the Seaside Allotment Channel, and I'll see you soon.